Hey guys, on today's episode, we're heading down to Conway, South Carolina to meet up with my buddy Rusty from Diamondback Classic White Walls. Get away with murder in this town if you drive a Cadillac. Absolutely. They make amazing white wall tires, custom. We're gonna get a tour of the facility. Hey, right. I'm visiting, I'm Brian. Nice to meet you. Hi, visiting Brian. But in that facility, there's two Mercedes for sale, a 1990 250 TD and a 1978 300 CD. Now, those cars were owned by the owner of the manufacturing plant, meaning Diamondback, and he's since passed and it's gone to his estate. And now they need some help selling the car. So we're gonna go down there, check them out, hopefully bring them back, get them cleaned up, and off to a new home. That and a whole lot more in this episode of Drive and Protect. Bright and early the next morning, I headed off to the airport to catch a lift down to South Carolina in a twin engine Cougar. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering what you guys are wearing. I brought like a sweat. I didn't know if it was going to be like way cold. No. <laughs> Once we get up the altitude, it's comfortable, but down low, it's going to be, yeah, you definitely won't need the sweatshirt. hours later we landed and met up with my longtime friend Rusty from Diamondback home. Classic Radials at a small airport in his amazing 1959 Cadillac Coupe de Ville. That thing was awesome. Good to see you again. You as well. Yeah. How was Long the, time uh... no see. I do have one question. All right. Where's the bathroom? How you doing sir? I'm Caddy. Thank you. After a short drive, we arrived at his factory and out front was a 72 vet wearing red pinstripes. But I did want to learn a little bit more about how white Ooh, walls were made. Tire land. That's a lot of tires. Yeah. It smells like rubber in here. Oh yeah. This room over here is kind of the first step. It's our mold room. Uh, we're going to take our first raw tire. Yeah, this, I mean, this is unbelievable. I'm noticing too that there are some thin sidewalls or some thick sidewalls. There's even thicker ones over there. Like what's the deal? Yeah, so the, the, the first step you've got to understand is we're, we're using a brand new modern radial tire. Like just one off the shelf? Just regular tire, got exactly. It. The beauty of that is they've got insane speed ratings, absolute overkill right. for these uh, classic cars. Yeah. But we like to kind of do our white wall process to the best tire we can get. So step one is we get to uh, vulcanize our white wall on these. An existing tire. An that's... existing tire, oh. exactly. So that gives us full customizability. So now if you want a 14 for your Shasta right. trailer, right. or if you want a 22, for you know, your 72 Caprice, we can do that. All right, so it's a three-step process? Yep, so step one is basically removing all the raised lettering, Got all it. the designs, all the kind of BS that you see on today's modern right. tires. So letters and you know, all Checkered flags, Got lightning it. bolts, weird names. Um, and then we're gonna vulcanize on the white rubber. Got it. So step number one is to remove the stock or the standard letters and symbols on the brand new tire. Then the thick colored rubber is added in its desired width. So moving on to step two is the actual vulcanization process. So it's heat, pressure, and time yeah. that takes that, what you saw in the first step, the raw form. So now it's kind of spread out a bit and it's thinned out. Oh, way thin, yeah. But this is gonna end up as a red line. So the, the, the business area is right here, uh -huh. that 3 8 So we're gonna remove all this excess rubber so that you get that final raised uh, red line that's gonna look the part, be very serviceable. And again, it's on a brand new modern radial. So the thick, part over exactly. there went into something got like heated up correct crushed down correct. or whatever spread out and it's got the right contour so that it matches the sidewall so that we know that we have enough material to work with after step two okay so i'm guessing step three you clean all this up exactly you've got it so step number three is the finishing process what we do is we take a tire we're going to measure the appropriate width of the tire it's all based on the order uh, on this tire it's a two inch what we do is we mark the two inch mark i set, already set the laser here to where i know where to cut it I'm going to trim the excess rubber off from this point out, smooth off any of this uh, design stuff on the upper sidewall, and I'll come to the other side and I'll smooth it all out. And once I do that, I'll go over the face of it and make it nice and pretty, and you got a finished white wall. That's it. After step three, um, we're basically just gonna spray this blue protective coating on it. It's a water soluble coating. You spray it with a hose. Once you get them mounted on your vehicle, mm -hmm. go have a beer, wait five minutes, spray it again, it washes right off. Really? Yeah. We wrap it, put uh, cardboard on it, wrap it again, and it protects the tire and shipping. Cut it open, throw it away, and mount them on the wheel, and 
Off we roll. After my tour of the white wall factory, Rusty walked me over to the hidden cars amongst the tires. Both were covered in spider webs and animal prints, but they were awesome. Yes. Wow, the look at this. Bill Chapman's wagon. You can see the tires all stuck in mud. Yeah. Unbelievable, look at all the junk on here. It may look like a normal wagon, but it's a pretty rare bird. Um, it's actually imported from Portugal. It's a 250 TD diesel five-speed manual uh, wagon. That sounds... Unbelievable. Yeah. Some guys living in here. That's a mud dauber. Yeah. What is that? Uh, like a wasp or something? Yeah, so it starts as like a larvae, and so they create these horrific mud nests, and then they're going to fly out. Yeah. I think I had one in the 401 restoration of the airplane. They sure. were like stuck to like these curtains. It was awful. Yeah. They get they get pretty big. All right, so then what do we have over here? So this is, uh, again, Late Bill's W123 Coupe, that's the chassis code. It's a 300CD non-turbo. Um, he was a diesel Mercedes enthusiast. He'd buy one, drive it for a little bit, let it sit, buy another one. Um, these cars have gained a lot of provenance because these are, these are like what you see as taxis in like Greece and Europe and stuff uh -huh. like that because they're known for having an almost indestructible motor. Um, this is the OM617 inline five cylinder. Um, there are many of these that have made it over a million miles. Really? Yeah, original head gaskets. How many I mean, miles are on this? This has under 100,000. Yeah, oh so this gosh. is um, this is a pretty, pretty rare bird here. Both cars are unique and rare in their own way, but definitely in need of some major cleaning. But I did want to know if they started. Set a timer, 30 minutes. Both of these are blowing black smoke out the back. To get them started, Rusty first checked the oil and the coolant before installing a fresh battery. Once everything was tightened down, he then checked the glow plug relay and, of course, checked the oil on the top end to make sure everything was going to be lubricated. It looked good, so I gave it its first start. You're kidding me. Is it clattering up front? That's one down. This thing wasn't running for, what, 10, 12, 20, 15? What are we talking Almost about? Almost 10 years. I mean, he had, uh, you can hear that top end clatter a little bit, oh, but high-pressure diesel injection pumps. They'll store all that. And clear right out. This thing is awesome. All right, one all right. down. One down. A rag, Larry. Thank you. There's fluid. There's fluid. Let's see if we get here. Boom. Um, when you hear about a vehicle like dieseling, um, it's where these are still glowing. Right? There's not an electrical input to it. They're still glowing. You still have diesel because the vacuum's pulling it in. And you still have air because it's not closed off. This diesel engine, when you turn the key off, it cuts the air. So let's say you had a major vacuum leak, these will run on. And that's why if you look over here, see that stop tab? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's say it ran on, because that's a big, it's, it's a big problem. It won't accelerate, but what it will do is just continue running even with the key out. You would press this down and it's going to suffocate the cylinders. Got it. Yep. Dude. Told you. <laughs> I knew it. That is incredible. Yeah. You know how much work we have to do on a normal car that does, that's not a they're, diesel? They're dumb you got to play with this, you got to poke that, you got to poke that. God, I love diesels. Besides it smelling bad inside, yeah, it actually looks pretty That's good. That's why you're here. What do they say? I love it when a plan I, comes together. Plan 18, comes together. right? I'm too sweaty for this. Wow. <laughs> Look at all this stuff, dude. With these now both I running, I agreed to take the unique Mercedes back to the studio and get them cleaned up and hopefully off to a new home for the family. By the way, if you were ever in doubt of Rusty's loyalty oh to Mercedes-Benz, check up. out his back tattoo. Absolutely awesome dude, and he has amazing car stories. So I know I have to find the right home for these cars. How you guys doing, okay? Yes? Yeah. Good? Yeah. You know what? Just, you guys send it back. I'll fly on the way home. Yeah. You relax. Hello. How are you? Just dropping them back off in the old car.
A few days later, they both arrived and the windshields were so oh, dirty I couldn't gross. see where I was going. And after a bit of jockeying the cars around, I got them both inside the studio anything. and I just had to start the 300 immediately. I couldn't wait. I can't see anything out of here. This is awesome. See, now the problem is I like this one better than the other one, but now I like the other one. Two guys in the world right now. Here we go. Woohoo! I see some new rims in our future. Under the lights inside, you can really see just how much junk is on the paint in every crease and crevice. Underneath, there's spider webs everywhere. Inside, same sort of thing. Lots of dust, spider webs. The door jams were abnormally dirty as well, and a bit of white mold on the front of the seats and the back of the seats. But overall, it was in good condition considering it had been sitting outside all these years. So with that, step one is pretty easy. Lift the car up and remove the wheels. When I did, check out what I found when I removed the first driver's side wheel up front. That is insane. Just crazy. I've never seen that before in my life. Oh my God. With the car up in the air, the undercarriage looked good as well, of course, with spider webs and pockets of mud everywhere. Now, this car was clearly driven on some sort of South Carolina back road. Check out just how much dirt came off the wheel wells onto my floor, and I find mud in hidden pockets absolutely everywhere. Next, I filled the foam gun with foam soap and brute wheel soap and laid a thick coat on the undercarriage in the wheel wells. Let's do this. Wet and long. After a few minutes of soaking, I scrubbed with a dual density undercarriage scrub brush and the stuck on dirt just poured off after the final pressure washing. Finally, I used compressed air in a blue towel to help me find the last hidden spots of dirt I didn't find with the power washer. Perfect example is inside the front springs. I found leaves and twigs trapped inside. Now, compressed air is vital to this type of detailing. Even after all of the power washing, I still found those pockets of mud and leaves and twigs inside the bumper and pretty much everywhere. And by the time I was done, I was covered in mud and dirt, but the car probably lost about five pounds in the process. I repeated the same steps on the paint and glass, so enjoy the power washing process. The transformation from just this alone was huge. On older cars during the rinse phase, I like to blow out the gas tank drainage with an air nozzle as it usually gets clogged up with leaves and junk, which will puddle the water in the gas door compartment that may damage the paint over time as it sits. Up front, the engine had a ton of leaves jammed in all the corners, so I decided to use the pressure washer to help remove the ones that I couldn't reach with my fingers. So I covered the fuse box with a towel to avoid splashing it when we went nuts with the power washer. I also added a bit of degreaser to pretty much everything under the hood, let it sit for a bit, then coated the engine and the paint in foam before giving it its first wash in over a decade. After the rinse, I decided to clay the paint now to make my life a little bit easier later on when I'm polishing and look at the clay before and after. Lots of contaminants obviously hit the paint when she sat outside all those years. When I was done with the clay, I rinsed one last time and then dried with compressed air and a microfiber towel.
Early the next day, I started the polishing process by first measuring the paint. The hood ranged between 8 and 9 mils, while the rest of the car was around 3 to 5, which indicates to me that the hood may have been resprayed during its life. To test the paint, I first compounded with a wool pad, then polished with a yellow foam pad and polish, and the results were absolutely amazing. Now, as we're rounding third on the compound and polish, I found a couple of different spots here that have years old, maybe 10, 12 year old sap here. It is incredibly hard and dense and it's just heated up and cooled down, heated up and cooled down. It's just made it sort of like a diamond. So you can't use regular techniques like, like a plastic razor blade. So what we're gonna do to get that off is we're actually gonna take a real razor blade. Again, this isn't for the faint of heart here, but it does work. You're gonna come in and basically just gently shave as if you were shaving your face. You're gonna gently shave the top of it off and you're gonna use a little bit of rapid remover to get the rapid remover to go underneath. Right now, the top is just so hard that if you put any solvents on there, it's really not gonna do anything. So you have to sort of shave off the very, very tip of it, kind of like clipping something off, and then all of a sudden it's open. Same concept here. Let it sit in there for a little bit, and then you're gonna mix it around with the tip of the razor blade, and then gently shave it off, and it'll pop off. Once you're done, you're gonna have to go back in and compound and polish it, but that's a way to get it off, because there's tons of them over here, and there's just no normal way to do it without this razor. So take your time and it'll work. Okay, at this point, I'm done with the compound and polishing and the paint came back amazing. It looks fantastic. I haven't put any coatings on it, none of that stuff. It looks amazing. However, there is an interesting little nerdy detailing bit. As you can see right here, there's crow's feet everywhere and it's underneath the hood. Now, crow's feet is typically when the primer uh, loses its elasticity. We've talked about this a few times. And what happens is, think of it like a rubber band. If you take a rubber band and do it a thousand times, eventually, boom, it's gonna pop. Same kind of concept here. Now, the interesting thing to me is, you know, you look at the paint and you go, wow, this looks great, even though inside, down deep, there are crow's feet, but you can't really see it. It's not affecting really what's going on in terms of its uh, beauty or aesthetics. Here's what's really going on. So if you look at this pattern, of course, I drew a little nerd thing here. You have the body panel. Now the body panel in this case is metal. It could be carbon fiber, could be whatever. In this case, it's metal. Then on top of that, you have the primer. These little marks here indicate or give an example of the crow's feet. When this primer loses its resiliency, its elasticity over time because it heats up and cools down, heats up, cools down, heats a thousand million times, especially underneath the hood, which is pretty common because obviously the engine gets warm. The point I'm trying to make is as it cracks, it doesn't affect the color on top of it. That's why it looks so good. The issue is beneath what I'm polishing. So I'm not really affecting what's underneath there, nor is it really affecting the shine. It's kind of a double-edged sword, but in a good way. So that's kind of what's going on with crow's feet in this particular car, which is making it look fantastic, despite these little imperfections that are down deep in the primer. After my labor of love on the paint, I cleaned the wheels that were in desperate need of some work. The before and after was huge.
on the start of day three, the FedEx man dropped off the new white wall tires from Rusty, and I immediately took them over to my buddy's shop, Ace Tire in Ridgefield, Connecticut, to remove the old rubber and to install the freshly made custom white walls as an homage to the late owner. When I got back from the tire shop, I finished working on all the trim by hand and the three inch machine when it was possible. And the before and after once again was huge on the old chrome pieces. I polished out the headlights and the clear plastic trim piece surrounding the lenses. For some reason, this was the most exciting part to me. It just looked really good from the front now. With the outside now about 90% done, I turned my focus to the inside, which of course had some white mold, some black mold, and every seat was filled with beach sand, which makes sense living near Myrtle Beach. So step one was to remove everything, including the mats, the carpets, and the rear seats. After three bolts were removed, the rear back came out easily and underneath had zero remnants of mice and pee and poo, all that stuff, which makes sense now because the paw prints on the glass were most likely now from a cat, I believe. The cushion underneath the seat looked great as well. Typically some mice get underneath there and they chew away. I didn't see any of that. I did see uh, one issue on top of the rear seat that had a crack and discoloration from intense sun exposure, obviously South Carolina, that makes sense. So I'm calling in the experts from Fiber New to repair this after it gets cleaned and disinfected. Step one, of course, is to use lather on the entire door, then work it in with the interior brush. Afterwards, use the steamer, then follow up with restore disinfecting. You have to repeat that process on all the interior. Now, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Compressed air is your best friend, and every pro detailer needs unlimited amount of air at their disposal. It's a highly effective tool. Next, I vacuumed everything inside and outside the car to avoid clogging my steam vac in the next process. Real quick on a side note, the cocoa mats that came with it are sick, but they are kind of a pain in the butt to clean. So the best way I've found is to flip them over, tap them out pretty hard, then use compressed air. Vacuuming is the very last step because they're made of rope material, so they just don't release the dirt really well. Having said all of that, they're awesome. Now, for those of you wondering why I didn't remove the front seats as well, it's because I had so much room to work underneath them. There wasn't any mold underneath there. They were very clean and it just made more sense to leave them in. After vacuuming everything, I steam vac the mats and the carpets. To do this, I first applied shag fabric and carpet cleaner. I scrub it in with a dual density carpet scrubber to kind of have all the material, all the cleaner kind of seep down. Then I immediately go in and steam vac so the material doesn't get over soaked in the process. Next, I applied Moose UV protection on the interior because it was just so dry from the years of South Carolina heat and sun. I gave it a few minutes and then buffed it to a matte finish, but at this material's age, it will just drink it up either way. Definitely thirsty after all these years. On the back seat, however, I did need to do some re-dyeing of the sun-faded material, so I called in the experts from FiberNew.com. You remember them when they did my Audi R8 a few years ago. It held up great, and I love it. They're experts in automotive leather, plastic, and vinyl restoration. So Scott and Daniel showed up in their fully hey, equipped morning, van, as I also needed them to work on the RS4 Avant and the 250 turbo diesel seats as well. So step one is pretty simple, clean the repair area really well. Next, Scott secured the cut or the flap of material and covered the area with filler. Afterwards, the heat gun is used to texture match the repair with the rest of the original material. 
After a few layers of filler, we are ready for the next step of re-dyeing to the original color of the material. Pretty close. With the proper color now matched, several thin coats of dye are reapplied to cover the repair and to restore the seat back to nearly new. Once the seat was finished, I reinstalled everything and the difference was night and day. With the interior cleaning now done, I reinstalled the fresh tires on all four corners and lowered the 300 off the lift for the first time in a week. For the record, this model didn't come with stock white walls, but under the circumstances, I think it makes sense to pay respect to the owner. And if you're a real stickler about originality, which I totally understand, by the way, then simply remount the white walls on the inside and it'll take you about 15 minutes to do. For paint protection, I added Reflex Pro Finishing Wax, AKA Blush, to the freshly polished paint and the gloss was just off the charts at this point. Afterwards, I applied Frame Pro to the faded textured plastic pieces, and I said textured because if the plastic is smooth, like the rubber in front of the chrome bumper right here, then don't use Frame Pro on smooth plastic or rubber. After installing it, the gloss will fade a bit as it dries and harden. Now make sure the area that you're working has been thoroughly cleaned and degreased. I cannot emphasize that enough. Just like a paint coating, it won't stick unless it's a thousand percent oil and moisture free. As I was rounding third, I then applied mud to the top part of the tires, the smooth black bumper inserts we just talked about, and a few engine components as well. Finally, no car is complete without a thorough cleaning of the glass with multiple towels, squeegee, and a whole ton of patience for a streak-free finish. Well guys, there you have it. The 300 CD looks a thousand times better. Is it perfect? No. Is it concourse? No. But it is a killer weekend warrior. This thing is just super cool. Plus it's diesel. Now this is going to be going up on mbauction.com. Hopefully go to a new home. The estate would be absolutely thrilled. I'm sure the owner would be as well. But there is one last thing we need to do. It is a diesel. I love this thing. I'm sort of falling in love with it. Let's go take it for a ride. thing already. This is the largest steering wheel I think I've ever, I feel like I'm driving a Mack truck right here. Look at the size of the steering wheel. Just everything about this is just, just amazing. With the white walls, it looks great. Wow, I can't believe we're driving this. Listen to that sewing machine. Ooh, shifts pretty smooth too. I think someone's gonna be pretty happy. And then look over the hood. Oof. That's as clean as clean gets right there. Now with the car running and looking great, I created an account on the mbmarket.com, which specializes in auctioning off Mercedes-Benz only. To do this, I took a few pictures in and outside the studio and then submitted them to the site and they actually write up the description for you based on the VIN and the info you submitted along the way. It was super easy and after a 10-day auction, the car was finally purchased from the estate. All right, guys, in the last couple of minutes, I've been polishing a car with Renan back there and watching my big screen here. It's gone from 8,000 to 12,000 in the last five minutes. Now we're down to four minutes, 59 seconds, three minutes left. What, seven minutes? It went from 8,000 to 9,000 to 10,000 to 10,200. Six, five, looks like Cowgirl's gonna win. 12,250 dollars by Cowgirl Blake. Let's give her a call. Hey, how you doing? Hey, Larry. Nice, it's nice to finally put a face with a name. I, I, I know you as Cowgirl Blake, is that right? Or Blakely, I, so nice to finally meet you. <laughs> yeah, my, my uh, 
this kryptonite name on MD. Um, I'm Cowgirl Blake, otherwise known as Blakely Vaughn. When I saw this car on MD Auction, I just, I couldn't believe it. The color, the leather, I can't wait to meet her and name her. <laughs> I'm so excited she got the Ammo NYC Touch. Awesome. Uh, it's just the white walls are beyond. I can't wait to take her for a ride. All right, well, enjoy. Thank you again for hopping on. I appreciate it. Thanks, Larry. All right, bye-bye. Now, on a side note, for whatever reason, I get so much joy cleaning up an old or neglected car and just getting it off to a new home. We have so much stuff in this world as it is, and it seems the older cars just feel better than the newer ones. Someone built this to run a million miles, and driving it, I believe that that is in fact the case. It sounds ridiculously cliche to say it, but I'm going to say it anyways. They don't make them like they used to. And I know these would be driven every single day if Bill was still here with us. So if you're watching, Bill, I hope you approve. As always, thanks for watching. And if you know of a lost or forgotten car that needs a makeover and a new home, shoot me an email at larry at ammonyc.com. Until then, check out what's coming up soon on the Ammo NYC channel. We'll yeah. see you next time. It's great a, color. Great color, Nagaro Blue. I think there's only maybe three or four in the country.